Hi, my name is Annie Evans, and I am a member of Virginia Alpha Upsilon Chapter of Alpha Delta Kappa here in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is a recording of a presentation that I gave during our Virginia State Convention in March of 2021. And I have re-recorded it so that chapters may share it uh, either as a chapter program or teachers may use it for classroom use. My current role now is Director of Education for uh, New American History, which is a project brought to us out of the University of Richmond. Uh, our Executive Director at Ayers leads New American History. And today I'm gonna share with you some of our tools and resources that we have developed. Uh, everything you see tonight is easily accessible. It's all web-based. There are no logins. You don't have to have a password. Uh, and they are freely shared for you to take and use to enhance your instruction of American history, geography, and civics. There's a bit.ly at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to share these slides with other teachers. Again, everything that we produce at New American History is under a Creative Commons license. So I would encourage you to share the slides, allow teachers to make copies of the slides that they can then use in their classrooms. We give permission for you to embed them electronically into a Google Classroom or a Canvas course. Um, we want these to be widely used. So I hope that you will enjoy the presentation and find multiple ways to use it. Little bio about me. I taught for um, 21 years in Eastern Henrico County. I taught middle school social studies, a variety of topics, uh, geography, history, civics, language arts. Uh, and then I transitioned to a role for 10 years as a social studies K-12 co coordinator in Charlottesville, Virginia. And then I moved on to this current role at the University of Richmond, working with Dr. Ayers and his team at New American History. This slide I like to call kind of our why slide, uh, why we started New American History and what it is that we are trying to accomplish with this project and with these resources and tools. So if you find that any of these speak to you, or if you would like to, again, use any of these um, when you're trying to explain to people what, what you mean by imagining a New American History. I've been engaged in this work for over 30 years now, um, over half my life. And what I find is that a lot of what we learned as kids and even as educators in our teacher prep programs was not the full and complete truth uh, of American history or of history in general. And so this work strives not to rewrite history, but to make sure that we are being a bit more honest and inclusive and that we're telling the whole and complete truth. So that's in the spirit of that, I'm gonna share with you many tools and resources that we have developed and that we hope that you will be able to find helpful in your classroom. This first image I like to use as a see, think, wonder strategy. You see down the corner, um, having students study a compelling image like this can oftentimes be used as a hook or to engage them in your instruction. Uh, this is an image that we will revisit a couple of different times throughout the course of uh, this program. And I would encourage you to take this slide and copy it and use it with your students in the same way. If we were together in a classroom, I would give you a few moments to study the image. And then I would ask you to respond either verbally or in the chat if this were a live session uh, or to have students you know, raise their hand or contribute what their thoughts were. What you see in the image, what does it make you think of and what does it make you wonder? Now, I would not reveal to them exactly what the image was or how it was created or who created it quite yet, because that kind of holds them in suspense, which is how we sort of hook them into being curious about history. So I will do the same with you for now. This is our homepage, and I'm going to toggle back and forth between the slides and uh, going out to the live websites because I want to show you how they work. Our websites change all the time. So what you're seeing on the screen uh, is probably not what's there today. And we'll see that in a moment when we go out to the live site. Uh, but this is our, our landing page. Typically each month we feature a blog post written by Dr. Ayers or one of our colleagues here. And then our different, what we call channels or uh, 
partners in this work, which include Bunk History, American Panorama, Backstory, The Future of America's Past, as well as others. And then we always feature a new learning resource down here. And one of my primary responsibilities as the Director of Education Outreach for New American History is to develop those resources. And I also uh, enlist the help of talented teachers like you uh, in this work sometimes. And we partner with a lot of other great organizations, including Retro Report, Made by History at the Washington Post, uh, and many other collaborators. So you'll frequently see learning resources in our library that we're going to look at in a moment that will actually take you out into other sites where we have developed content based on um, videos or podcasts or short films uh, with our partner organizations. So I'm going to go ahead and take you out to the live slides, so, site now. So we're going to come out of the slides for a moment, and I'm going to take you out to see New American History Live. And as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, um, it has changed, right? So what was up there a few days ago is now changed. We typically change our content around the end of the month. We actually changed it this afternoon, uh, which is why I sort of waited to record this for you so that you could get a better feel for some of the different types of um, content that we feature on here. So again, we have a blog post here from Dr. Ayers. This is a fantastic new piece he just wrote talking about the future of history education and how we are making changes to move away from high stakes, multiple choice testing. Hopefully uh, we're engaging in that work here in Virginia. We know that it's happening in other parts of the country and why it's really important that we have our students engaging in more authentic uh, inquiry-based learning and more performance assessments and um, types of assessments that are geared more towards active learning rather than passively memorizing things to pass a test. Uh, so we are very much advocates of that. We also have a bunk exhibit featured this month that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, and then we have content from a new, uh, we just recently launched a new section of New American History, which is called New Ideas in American History. And here we partner with authors and historians who find new exciting scholarship and new voices in the field that may or may not have uh, a big publishing contract. They're typically publishing under a smaller university press, so they don't have a large book tour or marketing folks to help them get the word out. But scholarship that we find very compelling and a new way to look at things, and we want to help promote that and get that into the hands of teachers. So anytime that you see the new ideas logo under our Medium blog or on our website, that lets you know that there is some exciting new scholarship for you to check out. And then there's a video this month from the Future of America's Past, which is a PBS show that Dr. Ayers hosts. Uh, and then a archived episode of Backstory. Dr. Ayers hosted Backstory podcast, start off as a radio show for over 12 years. And while Backstory ended uh, last summer, we have all of the archives and we can still use them as phenomenal teaching tools. And then this month featured uh, learning resource is uh, centered around the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which recently just had an anniversary. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing now in workplace safety, uh, we've had talks uh, recently about things like Amazon employees fighting to unionize. A lot of the rights, especially revolving around employee safety, date back to the era of those young women who lost their lives in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. So that's a compelling episode of the TV show and then learning resources built around it. If you look up here in the right hand corner, we have the explore button that takes us out to another site, which is different ways that you can navigate through new American history. So one way to navigate is through era. So let's say that you know that you're getting ready to prepare a lesson on a certain time period. Um, maybe you're studying the Cold War or civil rights. This lets you know that we have um, a blog post. That's one of our new ideas about the Chicano student walkout um, protest movement. We have backstory episodes embedded from that era. We have a short video on the history of polio vaccines. We have a map, a digital map, which we're gonna look at in a few moments uh, that relates back to that era. We have a great piece from the Washington Post uh, about Shirley Chisholm and how it, if not for Shirley Chisholm, perhaps we wouldn't have uh, women in Washington like Kamala Harris leading the way now. Uh, and then another short video, School Interrupted, and learning resources that are based on that episode about the Moton School walkout right here in Virginia. So those are just examples of 
Uh, some of the content we have, you can move between eras and see other content. So one way to explore is by era. Another way to explore is by location. So we are slowly populating this map. So each month as we change up some of the resources on our website, occasionally those resources take place in a specific geographic location. Usually they mention several locations. In that case, we're probably not gonna add them to this map or else it would just be dots and you wouldn't be able to see the map. But if there's a unique piece of content that is um, focusing on one particular location, our idea here is that a student can click on that and then it lets you know here, just like with the eras, the timeline that we just like, here is some content that took place in that part of the country. And the reason that we are looking at that is a lot of times students will say, what does that have to do with me? Or I, you know, nothing ever happens in my town. History is boring. This is a way for them to look at content um, that is taking place in their own vicinity. And the idea again there is that they will begin to uh, see that history is ambient. It's happening all around us every day. We're part of history. We're living through history. Uh, certainly this past year with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are living in historic times and we want students to see themselves in that as well. So again, you can explore by era, you can explore by location, and then you can also go back and visit previous editions, meaning what was on the website last month or the month before. So if you scroll down, you know, if you see something and you think, oh, later on this year, I'm gonna be teaching that, and you wanna go back to it, this is a quick way to find some of that content that you previously might've seen featured on the homepage. So in a nutshell, that's the uh, main page, New American History. So we'll, we'll go back out. So I mentioned that we have all these different uh, tools and resources that are part of the new American history ecosystem, as I like to think of it. Uh, and one of the most uh, widely used ones is Bunk. So this is Bunk. It gets its name from the old Henry Ford quote um, that talks about all of history is Bunk. And the only uh, history that, that's worth anything is the history that we make today. So uh, Dr. Ayers and a very talented editor uh, named Tony Field, who organizes a cadre of students at University of Richmond, where we're based, they are constantly claiming newspapers, magazines, audio, video content, um, and then our resources, including maps and podcasts. And they are generating what is, uh, to me, a large connection engine. So if this screen changes sometimes multiple times a day as new content is added. Um, and as we add those in, we're making historic connections. So we're gonna click on uh, any square that you could click on. I'm gonna click on this one that talks about uh, the Negro Baseball League. And what you see here on the left is here is an excerpt. In this case, it's a New York Times Magazine article. To the right, you see this little stack of cards. You see some interesting icons. You see a number. And then you see this button that says to view connections. These icons change. So you can look at connections based on the same idea as this original article over here on the left. You can look for people who are mentioned in the article, what other content is related to those people or that person. If it's tied again to a specific place or through time. So I'm gonna go back up here to idea and we're gonna look at some connections. So you notice as I click on the view connections, the screen changes. Now we have two pieces of content. There are two excerpts here. Uh, and in between, you'll see now there are lots of tags under idea. If I were to click on any of those tags on here, I'm going to click on Major League Baseball. The screen changes and lets you know that we have 30 pieces of content embedded in Bunk currently. Again, it changes every day. Uh, we're always adding new content, but there are 30 other connections just on Major League Baseball. We can go back to that. We can continue to look for other connections. Each time we pull up a different excerpt connected to the original, the tags change. Sometimes these icons, this is a core idea, which means it's drilling down a little deeper than just a big idea. And so you can start to see that there's lots of really powerful connections. Using this in a classroom, you could have the students take an excerpt have them find a connection that they thought was interesting, they can click this share button and they can actually copy and paste that, send it back to you via Google Classroom or Canvas. 
uh, or wherever on a Google Doc that you're having them share during remote learning, but they can share that uh, content. That's one quick way that you could, could use uh, one or two excerpts in Bunk. Another thing you could do is add it to a collection. So I'm gonna add this article to a collection. I could annotate it and save my note. It takes me back out. I continue to look at the connections. I wanna take a look at this one. I skim through it, I read it. I decide, yes, I wanna add that to my collection. I can annotate it. Make sure you always save your note. And you can build collections. You can build collections as a teacher and push them out as an assignment or as a predetermined collection of articles or excerpts or content that you want them to read or listen to or watch. You can also ask them to build their own collection. Um, and so there's a, a lot of uh, flexibility built in. Again, they don't have to have a login. If they're going to build their own collection, they would need an email. We realize that a lot of schools have email turned off. So in that case, you can build the collection and push it out as an assignment. When you create it, it sends you a unique code through email. You can embed that code in your Canvas course or your Google Classroom or on a shared doc so that the students can access it. So a couple of different ways. The way that you find directions on how to do that is up here, how collections work. And if you scroll down, it tells you how to build it as an assignment if you don't want to involve students using personal emails. You would click there and it would give you the directions. I'm going to go ahead and finalize that collection just so you can see what that looks like. And I actually had a couple of other things in there previously, so we're going to delete those because they aren't related to the baseball articles. Okay, so here's my very brief collection. Um, you know, we just did this as an example, but you can name it down here in the describe is sometimes where I would put directions for the students. I would say, make sure that when you complete the assignment or you create your collection that you include your name in whichever class period you're in, any sort of identifying information to help you as a teacher know when they turn the work in. Um, they can go in, they can adjust it, they could add questions, or if you push as an assignment, you could type the questions here and then they could respond to them. When you're done, you wanna save it and complete it. You put your email in. If, if it's a student submitting it as an assignment, that's where they would put in the assignment code that we talked about. So again, that's one way that you could use Bunk in your classroom. Um, so I'm gonna go back out to our slides here. The next thing I wanna show you are our digital maps, American Panorama. And American Panorama is a digital atlas of the United States. The maps are interactive. They typically have uh, images, census data, public records embedded in them in a variety of different ways. Sometimes they include diary entries or journals. Um, and this is a really exciting field under digital scholarship. Um, this new map, Photogrammer, was just released this past month. And uh, what they've done here is they've taken images, historic images, uh, between 1935 and 1944. And they've actually mapped them out by the name of the photographer and the location. So again, similar to that other map we looked at earlier where uh, students could find new American history content that was located near them. Here again, you can say to a student who thinks, oh, nothing interesting ever happens in my town or happens near me. Um, well, here we are in Virginia and I can zoom in and I can say, oh, Pennsylvania County, what images do we have? And sure enough, we have several images taken during this time period um, in P Pennsylvania County. Students can explore with County, they can explore Smith County and so on. Uh, or they can zoom back out and they can look at, um, you know, other parts of the country as well. They can do that by cities and towns or by counties. So that's Photogrammer. We're going to look at this, uh, these next two maps here in more detail in a moment. But if you teach civics and government, this is a fantastic uh, civics tool that maps out all of the House of Representative elections from 1840 up through the 2018 midterms. And we will be updating it with the 2020 election data as soon as that um, 
becomes a little bit more uh, publishable. So you can have them look at it as a cartogram here where you see the dots, or you can have them look at the map. And again, you can drill down to the local area. You can see voting patterns. Interesting to see when a certain district flipped from red to blue back to red. Um, you can do this for almost any uh, territory or, or in the United States. You see this F here, it shows you when a district flipped, which is kind of interesting for kids. And they can, uh, you know, zoom in and look more specifically at where they are located. So again, we're, we're trying to give students lots of options. They can do it by winner or strength of victory. Was it close? Was it a landslide? Or, you know, looking at just how, you know, the race ran in that area. So that is electing the house. And we have several other maps. We have a map that shows westward uh, trails. We have maps on canals. We have several maps that we're gonna look at in more detail in a moment related to redlining and urban renewal and the lasting impact of um, systemic racism um, on communities of color. And we're gonna look at some of those in more, in more detail in a moment. Um, but the next one that I wanna share with you is the Future of America's Past, which I mentioned earlier, some of our learning resources are built around that. Um, this is a PBS show. We've been on for two seasons, four episodes per season. The episodes are about 27 minutes long in their entirety, but in our learning resources, we're able to actually chunk those into smaller pieces. Um, season three is on hold now because of the pandemic, but we have managed to produce two shorts. One of them is about polio vaccinations, and the other one um, is about the 1918 flu pandemic. And so these are very timely topics. Kids were, you know, with the COVID uh, crisis, we were able to compare it to the 1918 flu pandemic. So things like social distancing and wearing masks, looking at that through a historic lens. Now with the vaccines being uh, rolled out, we're looking at polio and when those vaccines became available. So this is really a, another way of helping students make connections between past and present. And those episodes are both under 10 minutes long and have learning resources. Some of the other topics we've explored include um, Revolutionary War Era, Red Chicago, which talks about uh, race riots in places like Chicago and Tulsa um, that previously weren't always um, in our history books. Uh, I know in Virginia, the word lynching wasn't even mentioned until this past year when we had a standards revision. And so again, we're trying to get to that piece of telling the stories about the people and places that maybe we didn't grow up with in our history books. Uh, the founding of the Transcontinental Railroad through the lens of Native Americans whose land was taken to build the railroad or through the lens of the Chinese American workers who helped build the railroad um, and didn't really benefit it from it. Uh, and then School Interrupted tells the story right here in Virginia of 15 year old Barbara Johns who led the student walkout which eventually led to the Brown versus Board decision. So lots of our resources are built around that video content. We also mentioned um, the podcast. So Backstory was on for a little over 12 years. Um, and all of those episodes have now been archived. Many of them are embedded into our learning resources. You see here, the final episode is still at the, the top of the um, queue, but there are many episodes um, related to all different topics of American history throughout the years. And these are already built up into segments. So, um, and there are also some blog posts in there. I'm gonna click on one here. So this is Charles Dickens and his history with America. So there's lots of great ways that you can use that with both language arts um, and social studies. We provide the full transcripts in addition to the audio uh, components. You can also search for topics. So I'm gonna put in Charlottesville because that's where I am this evening as I'm recording this for you. And all of the episodes that mention anything having to do with Charlottesville pop up. Of course, um, Charlottesville, the Unite the Right rally, which happened uh, here a few years ago, um, but also historic looks at school segregation. This is a really fascinating episode with Alicia Lugo, um, who was an early school board member and educator at the time of segregation when we were desegregating the schools um, and other folks talking about that time period and the history of public education. So 
All the segments are there for you to use in pieces, or you can use whole episodes there. We have an exciting new podcast we want to share with you called Seizing Freedom. Dr. Ayers is not the host of this as he was with Backstory, but he is an executive producer. The host on this is our friend Kadata Williams. She is at a Wayne State University. She's um, a historian who helped co-author the Charleston syllabus after the Charleston church bombings a few years ago. And she also is doing a fantastic job hosting this podcast, which focuses on the emancipation and reconstruction eras in history. And it's very much like audio theater in that we have hired voice actors who are acting out um, events that occur that we know are historic based on diaries, letters, and firsthand accounts. Um, and so all of these have been researched by a team of historians and then dramatized with actors and then interspersed with interviews with historians. There's a map. Again, um, I love maps. I teach with maps. For every episode, we have mapped out and color coded the different places that are mentioned in that episode. So for example, this episode includes 15 locations. So wherever you see those blue dots, you can click on them. It gives you a little bit more information, a little more context about what happened, where it's located. So as the students are listening along to this powerful audio theater, they can also visually follow along and they can kind of see where these places are interconnected. They can start to see patterns. So we think that you and your students will really enjoy seizing freedom. I would say that um, as with anything that you do, video, audio, uh, print material, you always wanna read it and view it in its entirety ahead of time. Seizing Freedom does uh, discuss a very painful uh, chapter in American history. And there are some episodes that are not suitable for younger listeners and may be better suited just for you as a teacher for your own content and background knowledge um, rather than using with students. But I think that it is a very powerful tool that, um, is filling a need that that we have, uh, especially here in Virginia with the new African American history technical edits that were recently made to our state standards. I'm going to go back here now to the slides, make sure I didn't skip anything. We talked about the video and audio, uh, which brings me here to, um, this is a blog post that Dr. Ayers uh, posted this past summer. It is to date one of the ones that we consistently every week see people coming back to. And it's uh, from last June at the time when Monument Avenue and there were lots of protests going on, not just here in Virginia, across our state, but across the country um, after the death of George Floyd. And this week, as I'm recording this for you in the news, the trial of the police officer who was involved in Mr. Floyd's death um, is very much in the news. And so we've had a lot of teachers reaching out telling us that they're using this blog post in their classes this week. Um, I've linked that into the slides. Again, you should have the bit.ly that was on the screen at the beginning of this recording. You can use this um, medium post in your classroom. It's also, I believe, embedded in bunk. Um, and so you can have students read it. You can have them discuss it. You could use the jigsaw technique with it. But I think Dr. Ayers does a really good job of trying to explain that, um, you know, we didn't just overnight decide that these statues were not representative of maybe what we want our state and our communities uh, to be holding up um, as heroes. And, you know, it's not to vilify anyone, but it is making a statement publicly and in our communities about who we are, what we stand for, what we value. Um, whose stories have been told in the past and whose stories have not. Um, and so it's a very powerful essay, I think, one that you will find very useful for both your own content knowledge as an educator and also to use with students. All right, I'm going to get to some of the maps now that we talked about. And the first one I want to look at is um, this is Southern Journey. And this is actually split up into three parts. This is an interactive story map. Uh, we have developed a learning resource for part one, and we're currently piloting uh, the learning resources for parts two and three. But uh, if you look at our learning resources, which we're going to take a look at it in a moment, you will see the learning resources that are already ready to go to use with this map. So um, as we scroll through the map, 
I'm going to click on the first part here. This book is looking at migrations of the American South from the time um, of the late 1700s when we started forcibly removing Native Americans off of their land, um, talking about the impact of Europeans um, coming on the indigenous populations. And then the maps show um, primarily the white and black population changes over time based on bringing enslaved Africans here against their will. Um, the white populations as they moved, taking the enslaved populations with them. What you see in blue is areas where people are leaving in greater numbers and the parts that are lighting up in the bright copper color show where people are moving to. So you notice that Virginia had a lot of people in the early 1800s leaving, moving inland into that Piedmont region, um, east of the Mississippi as different crops began to take off, mainly sugar and cotton. And you notice down here in New Orleans is starting to light up um, because of the cotton industry and the sugar industry in particular. We have these slider tools here that students can use to compare and contrast between decades and populations as well. So lots of great analysis tools for students, both content reading and interactive maps that we find students really enjoy much more than a traditional textbook. Um, and again, there's, there's full-blown learning resources explained to you and to the students how to use these on our website. Also to go along with this essay, the essay that we showed you earlier um, and talking about the statues is on Monument Avenue. This was a commission that Dr. Ayers, when he was the president at the University of Richmond, he led for the city um, back in 2017. So just a few years before um, the dramatic changes that we saw with the removal of most of the statues on Monument Avenue in Richmond and elsewhere across the country and our state. Um, they were grappling with this topic uh, in real time in the city of Richmond. And so you have online exhibits related to the controversy over the monuments. You have birth of Monument Avenue, the life of Monument Avenue, kind of bringing it up to modern times. Um, and then you also have references that you can read. So they produce a special issue on Monument Avenue. So it's all there, you can blow it up. Your students can read it. Um, it's got interviews with people who are eyewitnesses. For example, this is showing the day when the Lee statue was first uh, brought up and people are traveling by buggy to watch the statue be unveiled. Um, but not everyone was happy even back then with the statue. This is John Mitchell who led the African-American newspaper, the Richmond Planet. And in here, he talked about this statue uh, saying that there were rebel flags everywhere displayed lines of Confederate veterans who came to watch the statue be unveiled. Um, and that he even then used the term emblems of the lost cause. Um, and while the veterans and widows of Confederate soldiers were cheering, um, you know, John Mitchell was pointing out that already this was gonna be part of this false narrative that would be told for decades to come. So that's a very powerful um, tool, the On Monument Avenue reader. We go back out to our slides. Um, all right, so we've looked at a couple of other um, websites. I do wanna draw your attention. This is what we just looked at about the Monument Avenue uh, Commission, but then also having students compare the images. You know, here's the Robert E. Lee statue as it appeared before June of last year. And here it is towards the end of the summer. Um, the New York Times now calls it the largest and most um, important piece of protest art in in the country um, because of what is the changes that have transpired in the social movements um, in this past uh, year. And so having students compare and contrast those statues, looking at them through historic lenses um, between past and present and, and today, what does that come to symbolize? I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the New Deal era and the time when um, the monuments were being put on display was also a time when Monument Avenue um, was part of this larger study by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And that was a part of our federal government who during the New Deal era was trying to help banks make good decisions on who should and should not be allowed uh, to have a home loan. 
And so this is an article that talks about how the Confederate monuments were used in real estate as a major selling point. But written into those housing contracts were what we now call racial covenants. And so they talk in this article from the Richmond Times-Dispatch from 1913 about the monuments and how buying a home in Monument Avenue Park, uh, which was you know, a, a section right off of Monument Avenue, um, what a good investment it was, how you would have access to these beautiful monuments, these tree-lined streets, landscaping, sidewalks. Um, but then the ugly side of that, if you look at the ads for Monument Park Avenue, uh, it talks about um, no lot could ever be sold or rented on Monument Avenue Park to any person of African descent. And then it goes on to say that no liquor will be sold on the property and um, no, nothing else that would create a nuisance or injure the value of these lots. So it was built right into the marketing and into the restrictions. So in other words, when you went to purchase your home or when you went to resell your home, these restrictions followed the current and any subsequent owners for decades. It was literally written into the housing contract. So that brings us to probably our most famous map in American Panorama, which is called Mapping Inequality. So I'm gonna take us out to the live map. So what you see here is a cities across the United States that had over 40,000 people in them were eligible to be rated by this homeowner's loan corporation. Banks, realtors, business owners were asked to come in and help fill out an assessment of these areas. I'm just randomly picking Philadelphia here. They had a grading system. Green was considered the best. These were the wealthier homes. They had the increased in value. These are the areas uh, where it was considered a no risk at all to loan to people wanting to purchase in these communities. Large resale values, well-maintained. Blue was still considered desirable. It's what we would think of as upper middle class nowadays. Good mortgage leader lenders would have a tendency to also do well to, to allow folks to purchase homes in here. Yellow, however, was what they deemed definitely declining. So people would probably not wanna to give too many loans out in these areas. And then red was what they called hazardous. And this is where the term redlining comes because drawing these lines around certain sections or portions of communities um, and, and sort of you know, we get that term red flag uh, or red lining from this uh, time. And you can see, you can actually go into these, uh, drill down to these different neighborhoods, and you can see the original documents that these realtors and business people filled out where they made notes. Uh, some of them are not very easy to read, and so we've got them transcribed over here for you and your students on the left. But things like property um, vacated by demolition, uh, some houses in the section are being held for sale, high uh, but spotty with colored and white mixed on the streets. Foreclosures were heavy. Um, and so they're making comments about the race of the people. They're making value judgments about the types of people who live in these neighborhoods, um, where it talks about how many are foreign born, in addition to not um, allowing people who were black to move into the neighborhoods. They also discourage giving loans to people who were foreign born or immigrant status, which at this time um, was a large portion of the population across the country. Um, and so you see here, people engaged in what we would consider uh, previously called blue collar work, lived in a lot of those yellow and red neighborhoods, and they were not considered good risks for the loan. So that's where the term redlining comes from. I'm gonna show you Richmond, Virginia, just as a comparison. And again, every city in the United States is not gonna be there. You may not find your city if it didn't have over 40,000 people in it at the time when these maps were made during the New Deal. But this is um, an area that many people who have visited Richmond will know because this is what they nowadays call the fan and it's right along Monument Avenue. But you know, many people are surprised to know that at that time, 
it, it was actually considered yellow by the time that this Hulk redlining, you know, we saw 1918 when they were marketing as, you know, Monument Avenue, Monument Avenue Park. This is the greatest, you know, part of town. People who live on Monument Avenue have this beautiful view. But now a couple of decades later, we see that it's, it's fallen into the yellow. It's declining. Um, and so we're going to look at what are some reasons why it would change. Well, here it talks about along Monument Avenue on both sides, 30 years was concentrated the culture and wealth of Richmond, but the peak has passed. Though this is a boulevard with a park center and monuments to Confederate, Confederate celebrities, interesting choice of words, um, at most intersections, it talks about how now giving loans out would be hazardous because they have been dividing these large homes that used to be single family homes into apartments. And so because they are now rentals, they have severely decreased in their value. Keep that in mind. So in the next few decades, this idea of urban renewal comes along. Now you notice here on this map, the dots are not exactly the same because this was not necessarily based on population, although the bigger the circle, the bigger the city. So you see things like Chicago and New York are much more heavily populated, Philly, DC. But some of the cities that were on the previously red line maps were not part of urban renewal. Some of the cities that were also fall into this category. So again, I'm going to um, zoom in on Richmond. So let's take a look at that area that we were looking at uh, previously, and I'm going to pull up the underlayer of redlining. Here's that fan area that we talked about that was started off in the green, would have, would have been in the green at the time when they were marketing the homes, uh, using the monuments as uh, marketing uh, tools. Then it fell into decline because of rentals and immigrants moving into the uh, area. But these neighborhoods that we see here were during the late the 50s and mid 60s, they were bulldozed over, uh, taken away by the government uh, for eminent domain, and they were used in, in large part to build the highways. So when the interstate highway system came through, you can see these blue lines in Richmond, you can clearly see that they bulldozed right through the red line neighborhoods basically displacing families. In this case, in this particular neighborhood, 97% of the families that were displaced were families of color. Only 3% were families who would be considered white, which many of them were immigrant. And so we see this pattern across the country. Um, they're not going into the green neighborhoods. They're not going into blue neighborhoods. They're really not messing too often with the yellow neighborhoods. Um, but they are definitely choosing to put the highway through the areas of the low income as, as partly as an excuse to get rid of those areas that they thought would not be, um, they wouldn't get as many people to put up a fight for one thing, and also the areas that they considered either an eyesore or in poor repair that they wanted to have a chance to regentrify or build back up with something that would attract new businesses or um, a, a wealthier clientele that was a better investment rate. So that's our period of urban renewal. Um, and this map, you know, students can drill down into that data as well. Which brings us to this map, which is called Not Even Past. This is where we look at the social vulnerability index to compare the formerly red nine neighborhoods to see where they are today. So again, I'm gonna click on Richmond Here's our map that we've looked at previously. Here's that area along Monument Avenue with the fan. So if we are look at that area today, we see that some of it is still in the yellow. In fact, some of it's declined slightly, moving towards the red in a, a small pocket there. But a lot of it is now considered what would be in the green. And you see that area that was previously mostly yellow and red is now mostly green. So this area is, is a good example of gentrification, right? an area that was previously yellow, but now most of it is green. Um, if we were to um, look at some of these other areas, you can see, yep, they're still in the green, still in the green.
And also it has information here about healthcare. So people who are living in red line neighborhoods, we know uh, tend to be in low income situations, which means they also have a higher rate of asthma, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, and other pre-existing health conditions. So we can see here that living in neighborhoods where you don't have access to great medical care, if you don't have access to public transportation, that creates situations like uh, food deserts where you may not be able to walk or get easily to a grocery store, which means you're not likely to be um, having the nutritional benefits of fresh fruits and vegetables. You tend to have to shop at convenience stores, eat a lot of canned or processed foods, um, and those contribute to these types of underlying health conditions. Keep that in mind because uh, we're going to look at that again in a moment. So this is um, a map that um, you know is used in environmental science and history and geography classes to kind of paint that story of how systemic racism still haunts us today. This is an article from the New York Times that came out this past summer. Um, some incredible scholarship out of the Science Museum of Virginia, um, working in connection with our digital scholarship lab uh, that creates the American Panorama Maps. And they're looking at formerly redlined neighborhoods and environmental impacts of redlining. And so as we start to see those red lines that we've been looking at, here's that fan area again that we have been looking at. Here are those red areas where the highway system came through. And where you see the dark orange is where um, they did a heat study, meaning that they went out and took the temperature for several days in a row during different seasons of the year to show that there's definitely um, a pattern. People who lived in the red line neighborhoods, uh, if you remember when we were looking at Monument Park Avenue, they talked about the beautiful shade trees and all the landscaping, but the red line neighborhoods didn't have beautiful shade trees. They didn't have parks and green spaces. And so now we find that those areas um, suffer from extreme heat in the summer. Many of those people can't afford or don't have working air conditioners. We know that they have underlying health conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes. And so all of these contribute to higher mortality rates or increased um, suffering when things like COVID-19 hit. Uh, people living in close, close proximity in rental units. And so all of those are contributing factors, environmental factors, health factors, financial factors. So this last map I wanna look at, I think you will uh, recognize as we scroll through. Now, this is a fictitious map. This is not Richmond. This is not any particular place, but we have seen this image. If you think back to the beginning of our time together, uh, what we did was we took all of those original scanned documents where we were looking at the comments made by the realtors and the business people who were scoring the neighborhoods, deciding which ones were green and which were blue and which were red. And we took all of those descriptions and put them into what we call a word cloud. You've probably seen these before. So the bigger the word, the more often that word was used. And this is just to illustrate to our students that people living in poverty are more susceptible not only to, as we talked about, food deserts, lack of nutritious food, lack of access to health care, and it really impacts their quality of life. And a lot of that comes from the general, generational wealth that they were denied when their families were not able to secure a loan to purchase a home like other families were. Those people often were left without choices. And so people living in the red and yellow neighborhoods are seeing things like sewers and odors and treeless and wells and dump and swamp. People living in the yellow talked about a lot of paved surfaces which collect that heat and trap it in the summer, like we looked at in that heat map. Um, but people living in the blue and green, we see words like wooded and landscaping and parks and golf courses. Um, and so I think this is a very compelling image where we wanna to talk to students about systemic racism, about um, taking opportunities away from families decades ago and how families are still suffering as a result of those decisions that were made by policymakers and lenders um, and business people decades ago. Which brings us full circle back to Bunk. Our original article that talked about using those monuments to sell um, houses. We look here at the 
power of empty pedestals, talking about the monuments that were removed, the last one being the Lee statue, which is still tied up in litigation. Again, helping students make those powerful connections. Uh, I wanna go back out to the slides and point a couple of things out to you as we wrap things up. All of the maps that I've shared with you tonight are hyperlinked into the PowerPoint slides or the Google slides rather. And so you can take them again. They're all ready to go use with your students, the scan documents, the descriptions. These are the descriptions that we cut and pasted into those word clouds. Uh, so your students could kind of get an idea. Um, these are the, some of the learning resources that are directly tied to those maps or connections out to the maps. But this is really interesting. Um, if you're teaching civics or government, the Realtor's Code of Ethics from 1924 to 1950 kind of um, emphasized those racial covenants that we talked about that are embedded in the housing contracts. Talking about um, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, whose presence will be detrimental to property value. And this was challenged in court as early as 1948. Supreme Court heard the case of Shelley versus Kramer. At that time, in the late 1940s, they ruled that these racial covenants were in violation of the 14th Amendment. And so you can direct your students' attention right there using these slides. So they rewrote the Realtor's Code of Ethics. They took the word race out but they still talked about not introducing um, into a neighborhood the character of property use that would be detrimental. So they took the word race out, but they continued the practice for a very long time. The Fair Housing Act that President Johnson signed in 1968 made it a little more um, emphatic. Not only can you not discriminate because of race, but you cannot discriminate because of gender, because of marital status, for example, a single parent being discriminated against trying to purchase a home because of your religion, because of a disability. All of that was spelled very clearly out in the Fair Housing Act. So you would think that by 1968, those racial covenants would no longer be written into housing contracts and passed on from owner to owner. But that's simply not true. Many of you would be shocked to know that here in Virginia, racial covenants continued to be passed down generation to generation as people inherited or purchased homes, if they included those racially restrictive covenants in the original housing contract, they continued even after 1968 to be legally embedded as a clause in that contract. And at the closing meetings, realtors and lawyers would have to point those clauses out and have the new owners initial that they understood that they could not enforce them but they could not legally remove them from the contracts until a young couple who wanted to purchase a home that was a same sex couple went to a closing meeting for a home. And when they were referred to this racially restrictive covenant and asked to sign, they said no. They said that they knew what it felt like to be discriminated against and that they wouldn't be a part of that system. So instead of purchasing what they described as their dream home, they walked away from it. And then they formed a grassroots movement and it took them three and a half years, but they got the General Assembly in February, just of last year, 2020, to pass a law that went into effect. So last summer, after July 1st of 2020, all racially restrictive covenants were removed from all housing contracts that were passed along in the states of Virginia. But we're one of only a very small handful, which means there are still a lot of states that are still passing those racially restrictive covenants on to the next donor. Think about that. What message does that send to this community, to our students when their parents go to purchase a home? So something, you know, we, we, we think that this is something that happened in the 60s, oh, the civil rights movement, that was so long ago, but the legacy of redlining and the legacy of, of racism, we still have a lot of work to do as a state and as a country. This is a study by Zillow, which is a real estate uh, company that shows if you 
own a piece of property now that was in a formerly red or yellow line neighborhood, the appreciation value of your home has not gone up much, but wow, look at the green. People have more than doubled the, the value of those homes in those green neighborhoods. And we looked at the, the social vulnerability index. So we know that people who grew up in red and yellow neighborhoods tend to have less access to affordable health care, less access perhaps to more nutritious food, um, perhaps lack of access to medical care, which leads to other uh, extenuating circumstances. If they're living in those areas, we know that the heat index, the urban heat island effect, uh, climate change, it's getting worse, contributing to ill health effects and your quality of life. And when COVID-19 hit, people of color suffered at much higher rates and for much longer and had higher mortality rates due to the COVID-19 pandemic in the red and yellow line neighborhoods. We have that statistical data in the Department of Health documented. These are some maps out of the Southern Journey uh, map that we looked at earlier. This is a map from 2016 showing people who were identified as being in poor health. The darker the red means the worse their condition. If you look here along the Texas border, Native American reservations were particularly uh, high poverty or poor health areas. Um, and in those same areas in the South where the formerly enslaved were living and, and people of color live in higher concentrations. These are people living below the poverty line, the same places. These are a lot of the Native American reservations in this part of the country. A lot of um, areas that have been high poverty since um, going back to early days when slavery was in, in effect. And also up here, we've got some Native American um, uh, impacts up here of, of just generational poverty. So here's COVID in the spring, same place as hard hit, Native American reservations, what they call the Black Belt, high immigrant populations in history. And here's COVID at the end of the summer of 2020. The darker the purple, the higher the deaths. All of that's tied back to systemic racism, to housing policies, to lack of opportunities, lack of affordable health care, lack of access to nutritious food, lack of access to shade and good housing with proper insulation. But I don't want to leave you on a hopeless feeling. Um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit here in our last few minutes about um, where we can be moving forward. So at the time when the um, Black Lives Matter protests were happening in the Richmond area and across the country last summer, um, this community garden was started at the base of the pedestal of the Robert E. Lee statue. Um, they also were giving out health screening information, masks, canned goods, trying to help be people who were displaced or lost their jobs. Um, the Kehinde Wiley statue, Rumors of War, showing an African-American man on a hoodie placed on a pedestal, similar to what the Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee statues look like, was a way for African-American students to start to see themselves in history. A uh, very controversial piece of art. It's found at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture just two blocks away from Monument Avenue. And it was inspired by those Confederate statues when the artist visited um, two years prior to the uh, Black Lives Matter protests. We've already talked a little bit about the connections in Bunk. I was fortunate to be a part of the African American History Commission, Governor Northam put together, where we reviewed every K-12 social studies standards. We made extensive corrections or edits to the standards. Those were fully implemented in October, towards the end of 2020, and we um, are now teaching them in all Virginia public schools. Uh, the statue of Robert E. Lee was also removed from the United States Capitol at, by order of the governor and um, people around the state were able to weigh in on who they thought should replace the, the statue at the US Capitol. Every state is allowed to have two statues in what they call Statuary Hall. Uh, formerly, we had George Washington and Robert E. Lee when the Lee statue was removed. Um, a commission led by Dr. Ayers and other historians um, was appointed and Dr. Ayers asked school children, like who do you think should replace the Lee statue, who would you like to represent you? And the students and other members of the committee were able to weigh in um, and the community and public comment. And Barbara Johns, the young 15 year old from Prince Edward County, Virginia, who led the student walkout that helped end segregation in schools 
will be the next statue commissioned to replace uh, Robert E. Lee in Statuary Hall. She'll be the first um, woman of color and she will be the first teenager to be um, represented in Statuary Hall, which we're pretty inspired by. So we hope that the maps and bunk and the learning resources and the videos and the podcast will be useful tools for you as we imagine new American history. Um, all of the redlining data and all of the maps are available now for students to be able to create their own maps. If you lived in a city that wasn't large enough to be included in the original Holt study back during the New Deal era, we have incredible pockets of um, cities and towns across the country that know that redlining type policies existed, even if it wasn't part of the federal program. And so we have shared all of our data through ArcGIS and the Living Atlas. Um, and students can add their own data by looking up records of when, um, you know, homeowner property. We have a project going in locally called Mapping Seaville, where we've created our own redlining maps with students and community members. Um, and they can lay those layers digitally on top of the um, original Hulk redlining maps so they can see how they compare to other cities across the country. And if you're interested in more information about that, feel free to reach out and I can get you in touch with folks who know how to do that sort of mapping. Um, here's a link to some additional learning resources that we think you might be useful. Again, everything is under a Creative Commons license. And looking ahead, we hope that um, you'll consider using some of our tools and resources to further your journey as both an educator um, and also to help your students begin to see themselves in American history. We have a glossary of terms that might be helpful and feel free to reach out. We're on social media. We would love it if you subscribe to our newsletter. That way you'll know when new learning resources come out or when Dr. Ayers posts a new blog post. Um, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. Um, my email is there uh, and I'm very active on Twitter. I can provide free professional learning for your schools, for your staff. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. I hope you found this presentation helpful. And I hope that you will let us know how you are using um, new American history tools and resources. And thank you so much for your time.